friends we have discussed very briefly principles of pyrometallurgy in the last lecture and it should be obvious to you that pyrometallurgy means metallurgical operations at high temperatures pyro means heat so metallurgical operations carried out at high temperatures are called pyrometallurgical operations by the word hydrometallurgy which we are going to discuss now we mean exploitations of reactions in aqueous media but not exclusively sometimes we do we do make use of some organic media also but the operations are at low temperatures because aqueous media and organic media are involved they cannot be heated as you know water will evaporate organic media will evaporate but sometimes we do go beyond 100 degrees because if you make use of autoclaves which are high pressure vessels you can make the water boil at a temperatures at temperatures higher than 100 degrees and sometimes we do that for example in the case of leaching of alumina by sodium hydroxide leaching is much more effective and it is accelerated when the temperature is higher and we get higher temperatures by going beyond the normal boiling point of um, water by using autoclaves but even using a very high pressures will seldom go beyond temperatures of 130 degrees d most operations here in endometallurgy would be very much near room temperatures what are the advantages of hydrometallurgy the advantages of hydrometallurgy have been listed here hydrometallurgy is ideally suited for lean and complex ores because you are doing you are carrying out reactions not very rapidly like in the case of hydrometallurgy you are doing it at a slower pace at a, under controlled conditions you can control the composition of the reagents you can control the temperature the if it is acid the ph value of the acidic medium if it is an alkali the alkalinity of the medium so there is lot more control and this is ideally suited for making for app application in the case of lean and complex ores from which we can get not one product or two product but many many products in the form of metallic ions or metallic compounds so number 2 is that there is a greater control at every processing step it also avoids environmental problems of high temperature steps like roasting of sulfide minerals they give out sulfurous gases which are very dangerous also when you are letting out hot gases you are creating an environmental problem when you use coke or coal you create co co2 these the which cause environmental problems so by avoiding or reducing coke an increasingly costly reading reducing agent we also s go for a process which are which is not dependent on coke which very often is not available in india today uh, many blast furnaces are being operated on coal imported from australia and then made into a coke because indian coal is not suitable for coke making and prices of coke are going up but this does not mean that there is no environmental problem there are, there there are different kinds of environmental problem with hydrometallurgy which we must keep in mind and that goes in the disadvantages to which i come later then advantage with hydrometallurgy is because of the control you have on reagents and you can have additives you can have catalysts metals can be produced in a variety of forms you can produce sheets of metal you can produce powders of metal you can even produce powders with particular shapes of particles these have been achieved in hydrometallurgical operations and since operations essentially are at room temperature or slightly elevated temperatures 
things become much more convenient to handle and the waste liquor from the final recovery step can often be recycled means you are using some reagents which can be regenerated. Now, these are the advantages, but there are disadvantages also because operations at, at low temperature reaction rates are small, the concentration of reagents are moderate, we need large volumes of dilute solutions to obtain relatively small output. Now, in pyrometallurgical operation there can be a high temperature furnace in a small room and it can produce lots of metal and slag in, in it is a highly uh, space saving uh, unit, but in hydrometallurgy you are using large volumes of water with lot of plumbing, pipelines, pumps, diaphragms, uh, then screens. So, you need huge floor space and invariably hydrometallurgical plants occupy lot more space than a, a pyrometallurgical unit. So, not only you have large space because you are using reagents, you may have corrosion problems on the plumbing lines because the liquids have to flow through pipelines. These pipelines might get corroded and they also add to cost all the cost of reagents, equipments, they all add to cost and then there are effluents which give rise to uh, environmental problems. In pyrometallurgy, we had environmental problems from hot gases, we, we had sulfurous fumes CO, CO2, we had heat going out with hot gases. Here the environmental issues come up with the liquid effluents and very often we do not know where to discharge them. Now, you cannot put them into the sea which many people have been doing because the seas or the rivers or the ponds they have a carrying capacity and we very often do not know where to put it because some of them are not very safe if you just uh, put it on the ground. So, many special efforts may have to be made to do something about the effluents. What are the reagents that we use? Reagents can be acids, they can be acids like H2SO4, HCl. You know that H2SO4 is, is a stronger uh, uh, medium for leaching, but sometimes HCl may be preferred. There are alkalis, sodium hydroxide, sodium carbonate, ammonium hydroxide. Oxidizing agents are necessary sometimes like NaClO2 or MnO2, KMnO4, FeCl3, which will oxidize some species in the aqueous media. Sometimes we need reducing agents, SO2 and H2 to reduce certain species in the aqueous media. Think of the kinds of leaching reactions I have uh, here. You know, you can have a leaching reaction which is a simple dissolution reaction. Like, if one has produced copper sulphate by some means, even you know, by roasting of copper sulphide, you can produce sulphate. Simply, water will dissolve it. You don't need anything else. Acid leaching. There are many examples of acid leaching. Roasted zinc sulphide will be ZnO. That will be by dilute sulfuric acid will leach to produce zinc sulphate in solution. In ionic terms, you can write it like this ZnO plus 2 H plus to give you zinc ions and water. There can be alkali leaching and I refer to alumina uh, and that alumina can be leached by sodium hydroxide to produce sodium aluminate in solution. This is often carried out above 100 degrees by having uh, the reaction in an autoclave. In autoclave is a sealed chamber where there is high pressure and water does not boil until uh, at higher temperature. So, you, you go up to temperatures of 120 or 130 and reaction rates are high and sodium hydroxide dissolves alumina. We write this as NaLO2, but in ionic terms Al2O3 is being dissolved by OH ions to get 
uh, ions like AlO2 minus and there are also other kinds of ions, uh, anions that are produced. There can be radical exchange, means you have a solid CaWO4 leached with a carbonate, the carbonate enters where WO4 was there, WO4 comes out to give WO4 2 minus ions. So, you have replaced WO4 by CaCO3 and this is called a radical exchange. There can be oxidation reduction reactions like copper sulfide being leached by ferric ion to give Cu2 plus and 2 Fe 2 plus, it becomes reduced to ferrous or MnO 2 plus SO 2, Mn 2 plus SO 4 3 minus, it is a reduction reaction. So, this sort of uh, reactions take place during leaching and there are some essential requirements of leaching reagents. Firstly, agent must be selective means you do not need a reagent which will dissolve everything. We want to take out the metallic values we want, not everything. So, they must be selective, leaching must be rapid. You cannot have a reagent which will make you wait for long times, days and months. No, it has to be finished uh, within reasonable time. The reagent should allow high concentrations for rapid action. You know any leaching reagent is likely to be stronger if it is made stronger, means if it is sulfuric acid high concentration of sulfuric acid, if it is HCl high concentration of hydrochloric acid, but using a very high concentration has its problems. So, that is why I am saying that we should know whether we can use high concentration for rapid action. It should not corrode the equipment. Problem is if you use high concentration of acids may, uh, may corrode the plumbing or the equipment. Lastly, it has to be economical and should allow regeneration, because otherwise the hydrometallurgical operation would become far too costly. Cost is of course, uh, which guides every every process. This is in a nutshell the outline of various possible hydrometallurgical steps. There is the ore that you want to treat, of course, not ore from the mines, it has to be processed ore, which has gone through mineral beneficiation, mineral beneficiation techniques. It gets leached you get solutions which are purified, you get a pure solution, you can precipitate a pure compound from which you get an intermediate product to market or from the precipitation, from the pure solution you can precipitate the metal, that the metal goes to the market and you can get some byproducts. Sometimes one has to go through, come here in little more indirect manner because we might have to first go undergo particle size reduction, ground ore will go through this process and the ground ore may have to undergo physical separation to take out gang. We might go through a concentration uh, steps, then we might go through a pyro treatment, sometimes we combine pyro treatment with hydro and the treated concentrate goes for leaching. Sometimes this concentrate can directly go for leaching and so on and so forth. So, either we end up here or we can take the concentrate and complete pre processing to obtain metal or some metal compound. So, th these are basically the different kinds of steps that uh, uh, are involved in hydrometallurgical operations. And sometimes, as I mentioned, the hydrometallurgy can be combined with pyrometallurgy also. Now, consider basically what happens in a leaching reaction. <coughs> we have a mineral surface, 
it is not a pure mineral, it, 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 it may have other things also, but the idea is that a reagent has to come to the mineral surface, react, produce a metal ion or a metal ion complex, which will be taken into the solution. This is the metallic value you get. And when this is reacting with the reagent that has come to the mineral surface, you may produce some other products, which will diffuse out into the bulk. Now, the solution here, we usually call bulk solution and that is why we are writing the word B. The letter S means surface. So, essentially, we have a concentration gradient, because the reagent when it comes from the bulk will get consumed when it comes to the surface and when it is being consumed, there has to be a concentration profile from a certain value, it will drop down to some equilibrium value at the surface. Similarly, when the metal ion or metal ion complexes are produced at the surface, when they go out into the bulk, there will be diffusion and the concentration will drop. Same with the products. This sort of diffusion phenomenon, phenomenon is normally understood in terms of a, in terms of a diffusion across a boundary layer. We say that up to the pretty close to the surface, the concentration in the bulk does not change then the concentration drops, because there is a concentration drop at the surface, because it is getting consumed. Similarly, when a metal ion or metal ion complex is produced at the surface, slowly it will diffuse out, it diffuses out because of a concentration gradient or else why should it diffuse? It goes out because in the bulk it is not there, a lot of it is here, so it will gradually go out of here to there because of a concentration gradient. And again, this diffusion phenomenon has to be analyzed in terms of a diffusion boundary layer. There is a boundary layer where bulk of the drop in the concentration takes place and then it sort of flattens out. Same with the products. We can have a more complicated step, where when the there is a reaction at the mineral surface by the leaching medium. You produce a solid porous residue also. Suppose you create a product which is not porous, then leaching reaction will stop, because the reagent will create some layer and beyond that it cannot proceed any further, leaching will stop. But we can have a situation where the reagent comes from the bulk, then it goes to the mineral surface, there is a reaction. Because of that reaction, a solid porous residue is formed, which gradually thickens. So, as the reaction proceeds, the reagent has to diffuse in through the solid porous residue. And when the reaction takes place, it again forms metal ions or metal ion complexes. They must also diffuse out through a product layer, then into the bulk solution. If there are other products being formed that are in solution, they will also have to diffuse out through the porous layer and then it will enter the bulk solution. So, in a situation like this, there are several steps in the reaction. One is that reagent moves towards the porous layer, it diffuses through the porous layer and most of the diffusion takes place across a boundary layer. There is a reaction at the mineral surface. So, produce a metal ion or metal ion complex, which must diffuse out through the porous layer and again it is because of a concentration gradient. The diffusion will be dictated by the concentration gradient. 
it will go out through the porous layer then into the bulk and if there are products other products formed which are not solids which do not enter the solid porous residue phase but soluble they must also go out through this porous layer so so many things happen one after the another we want to analyze leaching reactions in terms of basically two phenomena one is the diffusion phenomena diffusion to the surface of the mineral another is the chemical reaction that takes place at the surface there are situations when this diffusion process is slow the chemical reaction here is fast in that case the entire thing will be dictated by the rate of diffusion because unless diffusion of the reagent allows the reagent to come to the mineral surface no more reaction can take place on the other hand there can be situation where the diffusion process is fast but the reaction at the boundary is slow uh, at the at the, uh, at the at the interface is slow in that case the slow steps becomes rate controlling same thing can happen in these cases also let me give a simple example suppose you consider dissolution of sugar in water now the surface of sugar is dissolving in water there is a concentration gradient near the surface at near the surface sugar dissolves to produce a saturated layer of sugar from there sugar has to diffuse out because the bulk solution is not saturated concentration of sugar is low so it will diffuse out from here there are two steps here one is at the surface solid sugar is dissolving to make a saturated layer at the interface from that saturated layer the sugar is going into the bulk you know that when you use a stirrer the rate of dissolution increases why does it increase it increases because as you increase the intensity of stirring the boundary layer thickness decreases means the layer that showed a concentration profile becomes much narrower so the gradient becomes faster the concentration of the surface and concentration of the bulk and therefore if the gradient becomes higher the rate becomes higher so the if, we, if you go on increasing the uh, stirring rate the rate of dissolution will increase it does not mean this will go on indefinitely beyond a certain stirring speed the diffusion rate has become as fast as it could and it cannot be accelerated any more in that case if we have to increase the rate of dissolution we have to increase the temperature of the system so that the reaction at the surface is accelerated because in the limiting case where you have come to a situation where you cannot increase the gradient any more the diffusion at the boundary layer has become faster compared to the reaction at the interface where from the lattice of solid sugar sugar particles are coming into create the interface layer so if we increase the temperature the surface concentration of sugar will go up and that reaction will be speeded up but not by stirring any more so whenever we have a situation like this we have a concentration gradient this concentration gradient can be changed by stirring of this system but there are always practical limits of stirring we cannot go beyond a certain uh, stirring speed so all leaching reactions are analyzed in terms of some concentration profiles that we can draw in our mind now here is a situation where a reagent is going from the bulk to the surface now 
this is where actually the diffusion is taking place. Diffusion of the boundary layer is taking place because it is being eaten up here the species has to move towards this and then from here to here it goes because there is a concentration uh, gradient this minus this divided by a boundary layer a diffusion layer and that defines a boundary layer. Uh, now, let us consider a very practical example where that uh, this kind of analysis helps us to understand the reaction. Consider the cyanidation of gold. There are it can be written in two ways. The first reaction is 2 A u 4 N A C N plus 2 H 2 O plus O 2 to produce 2 N A A u C N twice plus 2 N A O H plus H 2 O 2. The re other reaction is written which is which follows that. So, overall reaction is this 4 A u plus 8 N A C N plus oxygen plus H 2 O giving you N A A u C N 2 plus 2 N A O H. So, here what is happening is the cyanide sodium cyanide in solution is reacting with gold not to take out gold ions from the uh, from the surface of gold which is it is taking a complex a u c n 2 minus. Now, try to understand why we knew we are doing cyanidation you may say you know gold is gold it is always in free state and all that, but that is not so. Gold is found after mining embedded in rock surfaces it is not in free state it is in free state, but locked with all kinds of things. So, the entire crushed and ground rock is treated by cyanide solution and gold is taken out of the whole thing into a solution not as gold ions, but as gold cyanide ions. So, what is the reaction? We can understand the reaction as a combination of two steps. The gold is attacked by cyanide ions which means cyanide ions have moved from the bulk to the gold surface taken out gold and the other is this that we have another reaction that is producing OH ions. So, oxygen is also moving towards the surface because without oxygen this reaction cannot take place cyanide ions are moving towards the gold surface and what is coming out is A u C n 2 o minus ions and 2 H o ions from the gold surface. This is what we are schematically showing here that oxygen is moving towards the surface of gold particle and C n minus ions is also going towards the surface and from there is A u C n 2 minus coming in. We have the same situation we have a boundary layer across which diffusion is taking place and there is one area we call cathodic area one area we call anodic area. Let us analyze this little, little further. We can write the diffusion of oxygen towards the gold surface in terms of a diffusion equation the diffusion coefficient of oxygen this is the gradient of oxygen dissolve oxygen in the bulk dissolve oxygen at the surface divided by delta which is the boundary layer thickness and a, a 1 is the area at the site where this reaction is taking place. Similarly, for C n minus ion diffusion which is going towards the surface diffusion coefficient of C n minus cyanide ion in the bulk minus cyanide ions at the surface of gold. Now, we can assume that at equilibrium 
these two will be very low values means all oxygen that has gone to the surface of gold for uh, dissolution of gold has been consumed cyanide ions have been consumed so these two terms will go out and you can write for the rate of reaction a reaction like this that 2 do2 a1 only this term will be there from which we can get the value of a1 this reaction is taking place at another site and so we can get the value of a2 if you add a1 and a2 we get the total area surface on which all everything is taking place and we get a an expression like that now we can look at this expression and come up with many many uh, conclusions that if the dissolved oxygen is much larger compared to the cyanide concentration then we will end up with an expression in which there is no oxygen in the expression. So, oxygen will have no role in kinetics which means there can be situations where one does not have to ensure high concentration values at all. If cyanide concentration is very large compared to the oxygen in solution then we get another expression where the cyanide concentration term is not there. So, cyanide concentration becomes immaterial it is governed only by the oxygen dissolved oxygen. In the intermediate range we will have an expression and we know one, one knows that such values of uh, diffusion coefficients of C n minus uh, diffusion coefficient of dissolved oxygen and normal value of boundary layer thickness like it is 2 into 10 to the power minus 3 centimeter to 9 into 10 to the power minus 3 centimeter. So, we can actually estimate the rate of dissolution of gold in cyanide media assuming different conditions and you can compare them with the actual situation. If you find that it is matching one where the cyanide concentration does not matter the rate then we do not bother about cyanide concentration. If you find that there is it is actually following a mechanism where it's cyanide concentration matters dissolved oxygen does not matter. So, the process has to be designed accordingly. So, these are the sort of things that are actually done to understand these reactions. I will give you another example of a hydrometallurgical reaction which can be analyzed in terms of these electrochemical theories. It pertains to cementation of copper from copper sulphate. In a copper is less reactive as compared to iron. If you look at the order of reactivities in terms of electrode potentials or free energies of formations of compounds. So, the copper compounds are not as stable as compounds of iron. Therefore, if we put iron filings into copper sulphate, iron will dissolve and copper will be precipitated this actually ancient uh, ancient metallurgists uh, and chemists found out long ago. Now, we have the similar situation here that we, we, we this is the surface of iron it is not a, you, know, you, you put metal filings iron filings, but assume a particle with a surface like this in that surface there are some cathode areas where the copper ions in the solution are moving towards that this reaction is taking place C u 2 plus plus 2 e producing copper and this copper is building up. In another area we have the anodic reaction that iron surface gives rise to a p 2 plus and consuming electrons. So, that in some areas copper ions are coming depositing copper metal in some other areas iron is being consumed and a p 2 plus is going into the solution. Actually in an actual situation 
you cannot tell which will be a cathodic area, which will be an anodic area. There are some reasons why it becomes, but this is a very simplistic uh, representation. Essentially, what it means that when you put copper iron filings, much of it will get consumed and you will deposit powders of um, copper metal. And we can analyze this using diffusion equations. There will be a diffusion equations for the diffusion of copper ions. There will be a diffusion equation for if we neglect the surface concentration, this will be diff diffusion equation to give the rate of transport of copper ions. Similarly, there will be a diffusion equation for for the uh, iron ions. So, analyzing these sort of things, oh, we understand the process much better. Now, I come to a very interesting uh, topic, uh, which ha has been analyzed using the concept of electrode potentials, and that is hydrogen reduction to obtain metals from solutions. Now, you know when zinc is put into sulfuric acid, zinc dissolves and hydrogen evolves. This is because zinc is placed above hydrogen in the electrochemical series. We can write for precipitation of metals, we have to write as the reverse reaction that metal ions will be precipitated by hydrogen gas to produce metal and hydrogen ions. Now, in this case tell me when can we reverse the reaction? We can reverse the reaction by increasing very high pressures of hydrogen or by doing something so that the acid concentration becomes so low, it becomes so highly alkaline media that this reaction will go to the left. So, this reaction can go this way or that way depending on pH of the solution, pressure of hydrogen and of course, the basic nature of the metal. Like if it is if, if it's zinc or metals above zinc, it will be relatively more difficult to precipitate by using hydrogen. But metals that are placed below hydrogen in the electrochemical series will not be so difficult from the point of view of precipitation. Let us look at it uh, a little more systematically. The precipitation of metal ion, metal from a solution containing metal ion by hydrogen is in general, this is the expression you can write. Z is the valency m z plus plus x by 2 h 2 is equal to m plus z h plus 2 is z by 2. This actually is a combination of two reactions. One is m metal going into solution as m z plus and the other hydrogen ion going into solution as hydrogen ion. What we want is that this reaction should predominate rather than this reaction. If there is a strongest tendency for hydrogen to form hydrogen ions, then metal to form metal ions, then this reaction will go this way, that reaction will go that way. Now, let us see when we can do this. For liberation of M, we say that the potential for hydrogen should be more for the, e, the potential for the metal. Now, E H 2 is written as E H 2 standard hydrogen potential minus 2.303 R T by F log A H. This is a standard thing according uh, from this reaction you can write this. Now, you know that minus log A H is actually P H and this is 0. So, it this E H 2 can be written simply as 0 0.05916. This is the expression that comes from here. 
and plus a pH term. A pH term plus log pH 2. Whereas, for metal, we will have the expression the potential of the metal standard electrode potential minus this term log concentration of m z plus. Whether m will precipitate will depend essentially on values of pH, pressure of hydrogen and standard electrode potential of metal, metal ion concentration. Generally, the effects of pH 2 and m 2 plus are small because you, you, m z plus it is in a log term, you see it involves a log term. So, most important parameters will be the pH terms and the essential nature of uh, the metal. See here is a simple diagram to explain this. We are plotting here the electrode potentials of copper, iron, cadmium, zinc, nickel, cobalt. In this axis, we are putting metal ion concentration in molal. Here, there is a pH axis for hydrogen. This is the potential. The plot gives us these are the plots for hydrogen. By increasing the pressure from 1 to 100 atmospheres, there is only change this much of change. Whereas, these are the lines for different metals as a concentration of the, the uh, metal ion in concentration. You see the effect is not very much, but the differences are coming from their nature, basic nature of electrode potentials. These are highly electropositive metals are placed very high. These are less reactive metals placed low. This diagram tells us that no matter what is the pH value, hydrogen will always precipitate copper from copper sulphate solution or any solution containing copper ions. This is very easily known because you have a copper uh, an aqueous media with copper ions just pass hydrogen copper will get precipitated. This we know even from the electrode potential series copper is placed below hydrogen. More important are those who are just around that. So, we find that if we come to a, a metal like say nickel, nickel will precipitate only if the pH value is more than this, then the hydrogen uh, potential will become more than nickel potential and I am taking only the one atmospheric pressure value. Similarly, for cobalt we have a situation if the pH value is below this means it is acidic it will not be precipitated as a metal. If it is on this side if the pH is more alkaline we will precipitate the metal. Now, in the case of zinc even if we go to almost purely alkaline thing pH value is 13, still the zinc uh, potential is greater than hydrogen potential even if it is 100. So, the metal will not be precipitated. So, we control the precipitation of metal from aqueous solutions by controlling the pH value mostly, because the ionic concentration is not a strong parameter and pressure of hydrogen is also and does not change this situation very much. These are the guiding uh, equations from which we find that E H 2 is equal to a pH term and here you have the standard electrode potential of the metal. These are the two most parameters and we can calculate the equilibrium pH values for some standard conditions of one atmosphere of hydrogen, uh, pressure of hydrogen, temperature of 25 degrees and a metal concentration of 10 to the power minus 2 molal, which is a normal concentration in hydrometallurgy and these are the conditions. Zinc precipitation in theory requires 13.9, which is barely achievable. 
you can never precipitate zinc from um, aqueous solutions. Iron 8.5 pH, cadmium 7.8, cobalt 5.5, nickel 5.1, copper and silver no problem at all. I mean it will be precipitated no matter what, it is very easy to precipitate. Even in uh, acid solutions you can precipitate uh, copper and silver. There is a problem however, the problem is many of these metals like iron, nickel, cobalt tend to precipitate oxides at high alkaline solutions. Let us concentrate mostly on nickel and cobalt because these are the two metals for which hydrogen uh, reduction has become very important and large quantities of nickel and cobalt are precipitated from aqueous media by, by hydrogen reduction. The problem is things become easier if you are going to a higher pH value means more alkaline solution, but if you have more alkaline solution then you have a danger, danger of precipitation of the oxide, what do you do then? There is a very interesting solution to this and the solution is nickel ions will precipitate as an hydroxide by reacting with OH ions. We can reduce the activity of nickel ions by forming some complexes, nickel amines for example, by adding ammonia. But if you do that, the nickel has been more stabilized, it will not react with hydroxide, it will not give you the precipitate, but then reduction of nickel ion to nickel metal will become more difficult. So, on one it is not a win-win situation, you are doing something which is good from the point of view of eliminating hydroxide precipitation, but by making it more stable, you are making precipitation of nickel metal from nickel ion little more difficult than what it was. Now, a lot of work has been done to find out what, how do you find an optimum condition. People have found that yes, there is an optimum condition. Incidentally, what do I mean by nickel amine? Ni2 plus in a co-solution can react with ammonia to produce what we call an amine and there can be higher amines also Ni, NH3, 2 plus, plus NH3, Ni, NH3, 2, 2 plus, it can go up to NH3, 6. So, different and the more higher amines you have, the more stable nickel is becoming. So, when you form these amines, they do not precipitate as hydroxide, but then it will become a bit difficult for reduction. So, these two conflicting things are represented here <coughs> with as you increase the NH3 by Ni ratio and the maximum is 6 you need, you see the metal potential line goes like this, hydrogen potential moves like this and they say this is where you have the best situation, where you have the maximum difference between the, the between the two and that is where the industry operates with, with about 2.5 kind of situation. Now, this, uh, this is the uh, situation when we have uh, ammonia in uh, aqueous solutions with nickel. Actually, there are a series of amines formed and depending on what is the NHT by Ni ratio, you form different, uh, all the amines are there, but in different proportions. Like suppose it is NH3 by Ni is 3 then the, this complex with 6 NH3 is this much 
this is with 5, this is the 1 with 4, this is the 1 with 3. So, it is never 1 uh, amine. You always have a combination of different amines in different proportions depending on by NH3 by Ni ratio. We need nickel amines, otherwise we cannot precipitate nickel by hydrogen reduction, although theoretically it is possible, because there is also theoretical possibility of creation of an oxide phase. So, the industry has played around with all these things and come out with a situation where they will not precipitate the oxide, but it, they will make it possible for precipitation of nickel from the solution. Now, there is something more interesting. They can now precipitate nickel in various forms as powders, as flat tablets or as uh, long small cylinders using a additive called anthraquinone. Uh, Anthraquinone is a catalyst which plays around with the surface of the metal and does all kinds of things. This is its structure. The hydrogen ion comes here, gets itself attached, then it can come out also and all kinds of catalytic activities take place and using the right kind of anthraquinone, the quality of deposit is improved one can control the particle size, particle shape, etcetera, etcetera. So, I think the time has come to close this lecture. I have very briefly discussed the principles of hydrometallurgy, starting with leaching and leaching is always, uh, leaching involves diffusion steps of reagent towards the surface and the products coming out of the surface. The products can be a metal ion or a metal ion complex or some products. There can be a layer of insoluble residues through which things must go in and things must go out. By understanding the diffusion phenomenon, you can estimate the rates of uh, leaching reactions. And I have also discussed one very interesting example as to how you can analyze in terms of electrochemical steps, not only leaching reactions but a precipitation reaction like a precipitation nickel and cobalt from amine complexes. Thank you very much.